Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This is the EU Spectator Podcast. I'm your host, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Nick Zalewski. Today, we're diving into a topic that's been making handless around the globe. And uh, to help us break it all down, uh, we are thrilled to have with us Tobias uh, Belgrano, a political scientist and consultant from Buenos Aires, uh, Nick, Tobias, welcome back to our show. Hi, guys. Thanks for inviting me again. I'm happy to uh, to greet you from here, from South America. Uh, now, uh, let's start with, uh, with the story that's been grabbing attention, uh, the ongoing uh, discussion and the ongoing um, argument between tech billionaire Elon Musk and Brazilian President Lula da Silva. But this isn't just a personal spat. Uh, I think it's an issue that touches no much uh, longer than deeply significant terms. At its core, the conflict, it's about national sovereignty, freedom of speech, and the rule of law. We'll be exploring the, uh, the complex uh, lawyers behind this public clash and what means for Brazil, its judiciary and even broader global uh, political norms. And later in our show, we'll also take a look at the war in Ukraine with a particular focus on how the global south views the conflict and what that means for international relations in the future. So let's go into it. The ongoing clash between Elon Musk and Brazilian uh, president, um, it's making waves both in Brazil and around the world. Musk, owner of the social media platform X, has taken to his platform to publicly criticize uh, the judge uh, Moraes, calling him a dictator and even comparing him uh, with uh, Derek Vader. This exchange, however, it's far from mere name calling. The conflict touches on a deeper issue, particularly surrounding free speech and the power of judiciary uh, oversight in Brazil. Musk's comments reflect his frustration with the court's restriction on his platform in Brazil, uh, where the Moraes has led a uh, crackdown on disinformation. Uh, this thread isn't just a matter of ego or personal attack. It uh, highlights the fundamental tension between uh, national sovereignty and political power in Brazil and the global reach of tech platforms. While Elon Musk champions an open, uh, unregulated digital space, President um, uh, the, the president of Brazil and Judge de Moraes says the unchecked spread of misinformation as a threat of democracy itself. Um, the outcome of this battle could have significant implication uh, for how governments regulate tech companies, not only in Brazil, but around the world, as countries grapple with uh, balancing free expression and free speech and the fight against disinformation. Tobias, uh, this conflict between Elon Musk, uh, President uh, Lula da Silva and Justice de Moraes raised significant questions about the balance between free speech and uh, judicial authority, especially in the context of, uh, of disinformation. Uh, given your background as political scientist and consultant, um, how do you see this tension between protecting free speech and preventing the spread of disinformation? Well, um, first of all, uh, just I was laughing when you were when you were talking about the comparison with Darth Vader. He mainly compared him with Lord Voldemort uh, in Twitter all the time, sharing memes about him. Uh, well, in my opinion, it's a false it's a false dilemma uh, because, well, to start from the beginning, the discussion between Alexandra de Moraes and Elon Musk starts with the conflict with the uh, capital attack in uh, in Brazil. The power attack, it, it was not only attack the capital, but also the judiciary and other power institutions, democracy, democratic institutions in Brazil. With, when that happens, Alexander de Moraes, who is a judge, which was uh, named by uh, the administration that um, 
made an impeachment against Dilma Rousseff, which was the candidate of Lula da Silva. I mean, there's no like a natural alliances and, or sympathies between uh, Alexandre de Moraes and Lula da Silva. Uh, Alexandre de Moraes investigates the attempt against the demo democratic institutions in Brazil, and he started uh, he started to spot uh, accounts on X or Twitter that were spreading misinformation and uh, attempting to attack the, the political system itself. There's, all, there's also not only... The, the, the term is uh, like um, political militia or ultra-right political militias on, on X, especially to harass opponents or uh, attack uh, or spread misinformation against the political establishment and the political system. Why and what is the aim of Alexandre de Moraes? that the, he believes that these militias are attempting against democracy. Why? Because they are attempting against the system itself. And he considers he has the right as a judge to request the company Twitter to uh, to block these accounts or delete these accounts. This has um, this clashes with Elon Musk's uh, personal personal agenda of moving forward with freedom of speech in within within X itself. And this conflict es escalates when uh, Elon Musk says, well, I'm closing my uh, my company, my my office, my, the company's office is in Sao Paulo. And according to Brazilian justice, which has had a lot of cases in this sense with other uh, tech companies, the law of Brazil says you cannot have a tech company without that operates on the internet without a company um, that has an office in Brazil. So the, as they left the company, X or Twitter got blocked in Brazil, and that how, that's how this uh, conflict started to escalate and get in a, a worldwide like debate or approach. Why I think this is a false dilemma? Because. Uh, this this discussion and that's why it's so passionate and so interesting worldwide brings us to the debate of which uh, has which uh, actor has the main power in the discussion if it's the national state with despite it's democratic or non democratic but if the national state or a, a tech company this is also what have been and there is also in the west there's also a change in this in how the tech the tech companies are viewed at the beginning, for example, the owner of Telegram, which was uh, imprisoned in France, was seen as a freedom fighter as he used Telegram to surpass Putin's sanctions against free speech on the, when he was uh, exiled from Russia. And now he's seen like a threat and he's, uh, uh, he was arrested recently. So there's a completely change in the approach because uh, the f freedom itself uh, without any kind of control is not it's not freedom at all so many there are many personally in, in my personal life when i was a child my mother said we used to tell me tell me that internet is like a dangerous street mm -hmm. and in the street you have a police in the street you have a uh, someone that that uh, keeps the street in order. If you don't have any any kind of control, you don't have any kind of uh, of um, of authority that controls the street, there's no order and the or and the only order and law that it's imposed is the, the law of the strongest. And that's why this is a this is a so complex issue because it does affect uh, freedom of speech, but at the end of the day there's a um, there's a need of controlling illegal actions. No, no. For example, the Telegram issue was really was really was really important because there were groups of Telegram sharing illegal material or illegal content, and they needed the state to um, to have a little control in there and putting down that that uh, that uh, Telegram group that was uh, sharing illegal information. For also another example of in this sense is doxing in X or Twitter. I don't know if you are familiar with the term. It, it's been it has become really common in Argentina with the Millet administration that, that it's sharing uh, sharing personal information of people without their consent uh, with, with the idea of harassing them or uh, silencing them. 
the main problem here is that we have three, for example, the the what we were talking about, uh, the militias, the online militias. We have paid militias in social media to harass people who are against, for example, one view or the other, or democracy or or the or the esta political establishment. So. And as there is no control, for example, in elections, you have uh, during the elections, you have militias that uh, promote one candidate or the other. And that has not, not uh, there's no control on that. And it's causing not only um, a problem by the users of social media, because when you get to X, you you, f you feel like uh, you feel like distress because everything is a complete battle and and there's no like a normality so i do think it's a false uh, dilemma and especially because there are there are other debates worldwide not only in the west regarding this problem for example in south korea for example mm -hmm. there's a strong censor censorship of content for example in the context of their conflict with north korea if i'm in south korea and if i'm promoting uh Pro North Korean content. There's probably that I'm going to get my my website blocked by the by the national government because there's a strong law sec uh, security security law of promoting content uh, pro North Korea, and that in the end of the day, it's itself uh, against the freedom of speech. Why cannot we think about uh, other systems that it's not complete freedom, but it's not also the uh, a complete, uh, for example, a Chinese state social media where all your data is uh, used by the governance against you. Because if we don't give that debates, you are directly, uh, I mean, at least in Latin America and in the United States also, if you dare to have this, the, this kind of discussions without a, without a, with good faith, you are uh, directly tackled, tackled as a, Venezuela, for example, mm -hmm. in our case, or uh, a dictatorship, or you're pro-socialism, and your and your idea is to control the freedom of speech, and you're against freedom, and you want to impose a dictatorship on what people think or say, and that's not the idea. the The idea is that we have the possibility in social media and in tech companies to denounce illegal activities, mm -hmm. and, and the, I think that also what is sorry, just to close up. Yeah. What is also a possible a possible a possible solution, for example, for this is not the state to force the company to do something, because a company it's a, a multinational company. They can leave the country where they are operating, like Elon Musk did, and they won't. I mean, they will have a lot of problems against them because the company, the people will use VPN and the the problem is solved. But for example, states don't need to. States need to get modernized. National states need to go through a modernization process. For example, if I get, if I see an account that is going through doing grooming online, I have okay. to have the possibility okay. of denouncing that account in a, a state office, a virtual state office, and saying linking the linking, for example, the the. Um, the link of the profile and saying, I'm denouncing this profile because it's doing this. I can do the screenshot. I can prove all what I'm saying. And the company is directly blocked. And that's not autocratic and that's not uh, non-democratic. I mean, if we want the state to rule, have rule over this, as my mother used to say, it's through this dangerous street, we need to have a, 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 a police office to go. If you don't have anything, you are like, a, at the mercenary, uh, sorry, at the um, you you are ruled by the strongest, and that's not working. Yeah, um, Nick, I have in mind what uh, Tobias' mother said. We are on a dangerous street. From a legal, uh, from from a legal perspective, where do you think the boundaries should be down when it comes to to regulating speech in digital age? Well, that's the difficult thing and that's why i am very hesitant to even endorse this where i'm kind of a bit against this because in reality i see especially within the united states that it's almost impossible to do this in an unbiased manner i mean we see with the news that's coming out about how the u.s government under the control of democrats was pressuring facebook into suppressing news stories that are then still more prevalent on x and that's what 
anger some of these politicians where without a doubt, not every single on X is true, but at the same time, it does contain some nuggets that are true, that mainstream media tries to hide and that different politicians want to hide and say, oh, what are you talking about? That's not happening. And that's the dangerous part where it's very difficult to even create a non-biased monitoring group from the government who's going to target both sides and make sure that we're battling misinformation and disinformation on both sides. And I don't see, you know, looking at Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, I really wouldn't want either in control of that, where I know people try to say with uh, Trump, there's more of an issue, but looking at Kamala Harris herself, she, it's not only misinformation, but because she's purposely spreading what she knows to be lies, it's disinformation on her part too, where we know uh, Trump gets out of hand with some of his comments, but then she, uh, there she is purposely misquoting him and trying to say, oh, he endorsed white supremacists. One, it's even been fact-checked uh, multiple times, but there she is on Twitter herself. And it, we're not going to really ever be in a position where we're going to have a non-biased organization that would ever truly be capable of that. And Part of the thing that I know Tobias did briefly uh, mention with uh, grooming, how that is an important issue, but unfortunately, especially from what I see in the U.S., that's not the priority. Neither, as people mention even on Facebook with uh, fighting different terrorist organizations, they're allowed to have Facebook pages where the pages could be directly translated from Arabic to English. We know it's a terrorist organization using these pages. It doesn't get taken down. That's not the priority of the government. But now we're almost focusing, well, this news stories make uh, the politicians in power look bad. So we want to prioritize that over more of the dangerous sets, the grooming, the which, as we know, really is horrific with how it targets children, without a doubt, where that definitely should be a priority. Where, But unfortunately, it just, it completely gets lost. And it's just, it's really concerning. Where I understand where we want to fight misinformation, disinformation, but at the same time, it does frighten me when I'll see media sources that are supposed to be putting out the truth, but they'll flat, uh, flat out lie to our faces with some of these news stories coming out of the U.S. And the one that I'm uh, thinking of in particular, where they were also repeating some of the statements with politicians, for example, was in Aurora, Colorado, trying to claim that some of these Venezuelan gangs were in fact, uh, oh, don't worry, they're not a threat, they're not taking control of apartment buildings, but people directly uploaded their ring cameras. And you're realizing, no, this is an apartment building in Colorado, in the United States. This isn't in Venezuela, but at the same time, you're realizing, oh, wow. In the middle of Colorado, apartment complexes, we're having issues with Venezuelan gangs knocking down doors and forcing their way in. And at the same time, you have mainstream media and politicians, uh, like the governor of Colorado, try to say, oh, that's not happening. But then you're having the local politicians themselves saying, well, we know what's ha happening in our study. Unfortunately, that is. And if it wasn't for X allowing those videos to be shared, we would mistakenly believe uh, people who are uh, fortunately aren't with that. And that's the problem where we're seeing where it's almost like both of these platforms are in a way almost balancing each other out because while well, sometimes X definitely uh, will lean a little more right with what it'll allow or uh, exaggerate too much where it starts moving from the truth or no, that's not necessarily true at the same time that happens with Facebook or other platforms uh, such as famously with Zuckerberg allow uh, purpose uh, giving into government pressure, suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story and how the fact was the government knew it was a true story, but pressured a social media platform into not sharing it in order to not allow Biden to look bad. But at the same time, unfortunately, I really uh, have strong doubts that they would have done that, uh, for example, if it was uh, with a relative with Donald Trump, where they would have jumped on it more if they felt it would have uh, put forth uh it would have allowed them to move forward politically. And that's just my main concern is that the biggest issue that most countries, I feel, uh, looking at Europe too, a lot of countries do not, are not capable of creating an unbiased monitoring system. Where I'll see uh, different things too in Europe, where they'll try to say, oh, don't worry, this isn't happening. And then people have a flat out video. And the issue is, well, yes, 
sometimes it's AI, but when some of these videos are then getting picked up, then some of these governments are a little more willing to admit, okay, yes, it is happening. You caught us. And that's the biggest issue that, you know, without a doubt, uh, this is a big issue with uh, people spreading misinformation, disinformation from all sides. It's not just one side of the political aisle, but I just have a big worry that every ruling government will try to then use it to their advantage. So for example, in Italy, you'll have uh, Maloney using it to her advantage while uh, currently the Biden administration would continue to use it to his advantage. And then if Kamala Harris, she would get in or if Trump were to get in and it would just be a vicious cycle of it really not being to use to fight misinformation, deformation, used to uh, fight some of the nasty groups, uh, drug trafficking, grooming. It would just be more used to uh, fight political opponents, as it already has been to a certain extent. Yeah, but because... Just to, uh, just to interrupt for a moment, uh, just to interrupt sure. for a moment, because I was thinking about uh, while you were speaking, Nick, there are some little things that we can do to to stop misinformation that are very, very small in the, in their, in their, in the reach. For example, governments could enforce a X company, for example, or Facebook company or Telegram, for example, to do a face, a face scan, a face scan for to, or to, to share your ID as you can, as you also do in a bank account, at least in Argentina, for example, to, to create a new bank account, I need to use my face because if people get it, are, are, uh, are, in, I mean, are, um, accountable for what they say. They're probably no, going to moderate, you're uh, saying, but the... much, moderate much more. The problem with misinformation is it because we're talking about bots or people that don't, uh, don't, are not, are, cannot be held accountable for that. And no one is enforcing that. And that also helps the political debate. And will, it, it will probably moderate the political debate. Because, for example, if you, if I, if someone says, for example, politician X, B, or Y, it's, um, stole money from the municipal administration, I can do a, 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 a for the politician, A, B, or Y, can do a, a report it to justice and say, here, they are saying, they are false claim this uh, against me, and this, they don't have proof, proof against it, prove it. You use uh, uh, Trump, say, 678, uh, or whatever, you are not anonymous, I can press charges against you. And that's, a very small, a very small action that can that would moderate this information. Completely. I know, but unfortunately, um, which reasonably so, different states in the U.S. were pushing uh, adult entertainment websites. You know what I'm getting at. Uh, let's just keep it in clean for you too. Some states in the U.S. were, you know, pushing them rightfully so, like you're saying, uh, not necessarily where they're going to go run with your data and say, oh, well, so-and-so is watching adult entertainment. It was just to keep kids from accessing it. But the problem was sites like uh, Corn Hub, they just withdrew from these states rather than saying, hey, this is actually a good thing. Let's try to keep children out of it, especially with all the scientific evidence that exposing children to this type of content way before they're uh, matured mentally isn't necessarily good for their development. And rather than doing something simple as that, the website simply pulled out where unfortunately, I think we're I know what you're saying, but I almost see just a lot of these websites pulling out and uh, relying on people paying for, uh, what do you call it, uh, the VPNs. And it's oh, pathetic I mean, that example, these companies... If the US or the European Union try to enforce this, they won't have any, they won't have any, any option. I mean, they are not going to be out of the, of the entire European Union or the entire US. I mean, a, a, a state in the US has much less power, much much less power than uh, than uh, the entire EU or the U.S. Congress. Yeah, but because uh, both of you mentioned uh, mentioned the European Union and uh, the U.S. and because twenty twenty four it's um, a super election year, uh, given the fact that Musk's platform X or uh, or or uh, or Facebook operates globally how much influence do you think national courts or the european court of justice 
should have in regulating what happens on these platforms? Should should tech companies have more autonomy, or or do you think governments should take a more active role in in in, in policing disinformation, Nick? It's hard to say because I understand, I, you know, I do agree with some aspects just looking at the GDRP with protecting uh, personal data in the European Union. But I got to oh. admit, it's definitely almost led uh, to a, sometimes a lot more harm in the European Union than good because looking at how people inform themselves about U.S. politics, it's become so twisted because while the more biased news stations are more willing to put up with that, a lot of the local stations who I got to admit are amazing because, you know, they could announce some crazy news of that, like, you know, so just throwing out a crazy scenario out there. I mean, the person could just, you know, look uh, blankly into the camera without a change of expression. Okay, Donald Trump just announced a nuclear war on Iran without passing any judgment. And the bad thing is because these are more local media channels where they really are just trying to keep the bias out of it. They're just basically reporting the news fact by fact, but because they're smaller companies, those are the ones getting blocked out by the GDRP where they're just like, okay, forget it. We're not going to deal with uh, hiring all these consultants to rewire our entire website or how we do things. And then that leaves Europeans with listening to some of the most unhinged sources of news from the left or right in the U.S., where they just have a, sometimes a very crazy interpretation of what's going on because more normal local channels that would be better sources, they're all blocked. Because And I know this personally just from growing up there where I know which ones to search for, but then every single one, you know, uh, will... I'll tweet out pictures and tag our uh, Twitter uh, channel into it. Blocked in your region, blocked in your region, blocked in your region, where unless people are willing to pay for a VPN, they can't access it. And that's almost, and that's also part of the issue, though, is that which different governments also aren't necessarily willing to accept is that with VPNs, a lot of what they block is only blocking people who don't necessarily have the money to then pay for a VPN where people who do, they're still able to use these sites freely. We see even with countries like China, which are very heavy on monitoring, everyone in China just kind of laughs because they, if you know how to get around the system, you could use Western social media and Western websites without a problem, where you're only harming people who might not necessarily realize how to do that or have the money then also to pay for a VPN, where it's almost like, well, okay, are you really helping people or is it just another scenario where you're harming the people who don't have the resources but then the rich could still do whatever they want mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tobias the same question for you well i do i do think that uh, it's affecting democracy in i mean in the west completely i do think that in the countries where the state where the state uh, is more important than the social media or the social tech company Stability is assured. The problem is that it, in general, those countries are dictatorships. But the thing is, I do believe it's possible to provide a system, a biased system, which has democratic control. Because if we have a system, a system that help us to help us without bias and with legislative and democratic control, uh, you are able to get a balance without a repression like the Communist Party in China. The thing is, at least at least in Argentina and in Latin America, where the radicalization and their controls are unexistent completely and radicalization is emerging strongly, especially in countries like Brazil, especially in countries like Argentina and I don't know, other countries in the region, but especially in Argentina and Brazil, that is where the most... Uh, radicalization is going on, uh, there's a clear role in social media there. I mean, it's very clear how, for example, WhatsApp was used to promote fake news during Bolsonaro's, uh, Bolsonaro's presidency or how Twitter was key and using militias on Twitter was key for promoting Javier Milei as president. So I do think there's a strong role uh, in 
having some kind of regulation. And I think it's possible to think that the problem is in, in Latin America is that many of our lawmakers are not are not a uh, are not trained for this or are not educated in this in all these debates and they don't know which tools to provide to provide. But ma mainly in states with a uh, with a uh, in weak states like in Latin American states, I do think um, it's more difficult. But in modern states and in uh, first world nations such as European Union or United States, there's more technical possibility to think on, on this, especially from from the state's perspective. We always know that states uh, that states run from behind. But we have to start thinking, and the debate has to come from uh, from from the lowest to the to the top. I mean, from the bottom to the top of the political system, because it's going to be something that the citizenship is going to require in a in a point in a certain point. Because what happened in the UK recently about a fake news where people attacked each other based on a fake news that the uh, the I'm talking about the case of the the murder of the three girls in the U in the UK that killed three girls and was uh, and there was a, there were riots in the streets and people attacking each other in the streets and it was all all completely based on a fake news is something that people themselves are going to start requiring regulation because the the UK example is the most uh, the most interesting of all of them because we see the first time that people attacked or get into riots because some th something was fake and no one stopped in no one stopped to to say hey uh, no hey guys wait a, wait a minute this is this is not real i mean this is we are we are we are i mean we're, this is this doesn't make sense and the problem is and the pro and it's a problem with the truth itself is that the problem is if it's not if it's true or not if it's uh, if it's a verosimil, I don't know what's I don't know for uh, in for English for that uh, that it's a uh, it would be possible or not not if it's real or not not if it was con concretely something that happened or not and that's a problem that is affecting all democratic all democracies in the West which are not thinking on this it's all and I agree with Nick that the problem is that politicians in the West are thinking are in the West are thinking this to to their political gain and not in a in a general sense because they know that when they the administration changes they can move the political opinion against the candidate who lose and that's the problem we are having a really short-sighted vision on this and we have to think in a broader vision because what happened in the uk was completely insane and well yes but it also depends because there's also the issues where some people were sometimes possibly motivated by those social media uh, accounts. But then people were also pissed off with the BBC, which also uh, tried to infantilize him too much and uh, inaccurately giving a picture from him from six years ago to try to make him out to be more of a victim. And it's like, it was just such gross negligence on behalf be of the BBC that, too. That, that can be an interpretation of the facts, but not the facts. The discussion, he, the, the, what happened in the UK was with a fake with a fake fact that caused a riot in the streets and chaos in the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can discuss an interpretation of the facts from the BBC. I completely agree. You can say this is an infantilization, and and I don't agree with this perspective. That, but that is a perspective or interpretation of the facts. What happened with X was the fact was false, completely false. Yeah, and, and be because Tobias, you mentioned political uh, political gain. Uh, our next topic uh, takes us to the to the ongoing war in Ukraine and political gain of of the Russian Federation. Uh, this conflict, um, it's um, uh, th 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 this conflict has reverberated across the globe and uh, reshaped international alliances. Um, while uh, much of the world focus, um, uh, world's focus uh, has been on the battlefield in Eastern Europe, there's another uh, arena of, uh, of competition unfolding, the fight for influence in the global south. Uh, the Russian Federation under uh, President uh, Putin has been actively working to, to build and uh, strengthen the relationship with the countries in Africa and Latin America and parts of Asia. 
And these regions, often caught between co uh, competing global powers, have become key uh, battlegrounds for Russia's diplomatical efforts. Um, Russia's uh, outreach to the global south is uh, no coincidence uh, by uh, cultivating political, economic, and military ties with um, with these nations. The Kremlin aims to uh, to challenge Western dominance and uh, Western democracy in global affairs. Many countries in the global south have either refused to take sides or have taken more neutral uh, stance on the Ukraine conflict, a position, uh, um, a, a position Moscow seeks to uh, capitalize uh, to capitalize on, with promises of energy deals, military cooperation and support in international forums, Russia is um, uh, positioning itself as a reliable partner for for these nations in, in, in contrast to what it um, uh, portrays as the Western self, uh, self-interest uh, approach. Um, Tobias, Russia's strategy on, uh, of, of engaging the global South seems to be aimed at, uh, at uh, uh, gaining uh, leverage and, uh, and countering Western influence, particularly in, uh, in light uh, of the war in Ukraine. Many of, uh, many of these countries are maintaining a neutral stance or even benefits from Russia's offers uh, of uh, energy deals, political and military cooperation. And it's very important for us to understand why, because we are talking about uh, social influence and, and fake news and post-truth era. From your perspective, how significant is this shift in uh, alliances for, for, for the broader geopolitical balance? And um, what does it say about the, the, the changing dynamics of global power? Sorry. Just a pause a second. I'm losing power with my computer and I gotta connect it. But I, on edition, on uh, thinking on edition, I <laughs> let you. I let you finish with the question. Just give me a second. I could so, go ahead Nick, and jump in. Yeah, Nick. I will move. I will move to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So in the meantime, with, with while the same, he gets uh, with the his same power. question, please. I got to be brutally honest. I don't think it's necessarily a change because we've always seen some countries leaning more towards Russia. And I got to be brutally honest, I don't think mm -hmm. it's necessarily these. I feel like a, a lot of countries are maintaining a neutral stance because they don't necessarily care. Their whole point is, well, OK, if we don't still keep on getting fertilizer and food from Russia, our populations will starve. So we cannot afford to take uh, moral stance as the European Union and the U.S. has really pushed to cut them, uh, their reliance off of Russia for energy and to focus more on uh, Ukraine. You have some countries, so looking at into uh, North Africa, such as Egypt, where such a large percent of the, the population relies on bread sold uh, cheaper than it's produced uh, from these government subsidies, where if they were to say, OK, we won't take anything from uh, Russia, that's that would have led to mass starvation. So I don't necessarily see it's a change in balance. In fact, it almost seems like. It, it's almost seeming that there, you're going to have. A whole kind of left in the global south, because a lot of these countries don't necessarily like the U.S. and some of these U.S. products are just too expensive to even try to uh, move towards the U.S., but then. At the same time, Russia's really weakened itself with this war where it thought it was going to win and it didn't. So that really weakens its uh, ability to influence the rest of the world. And then you're also seeing China uh, with its own economic concerns that foreign direct investment actually fell 60, uh, 63% compared to last year, where it almost is interesting where all three countries are seem to be fighting less for influence than they were previously. And a lot of these countries where if they do still buy things from Russia, it's like, okay, look, this isn't because we necessarily don't like Ukraine or don't want uh, them to secede. It's just that if they don't buy it from Russia, there's not another readily available option. Yeah, and also uh, making uh, business with, uh, with the Russian Federation 
uh, there are no uh, barriers um, regarding democracy and the rule of law. Tobias, um, I'm 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 back to you with the same uh, with the same uh, question. How significant is this shift in alliances for for the broader geopolitical balance? Well, from Latin American perspective, there are there were some changes in balance in especially in the in the position of Argentina because it's the third at least in Latin America it's the third economy of the region, which had a, a, a non-aligned position, uh, especially because the conflict that uh, Argentina has regarding Malvinas, the previous administration, the the left wing administration had a position uh, saying that they will not support US uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine because it would be supporting an invasion on a foreign territory uh, with, uh, with, um, with the argument of having uh, Russian speakers in territory, in the case of the British, having British citizens living in Malvinas. So it would uh, affect Argentina's position in that. So that, that's why the, the, there was an abstention in the vote. However, uh, after the new after the the new administration of Javier Milei got into power, the position was switched to a complete support of Ukraine, which uh, in the region is particularly not that strange. I mean, we have we also have Chile supporting Ukraine with a lot of support of Ukraine, but also you have the biggest player. Uh, Mexico and Brazil that Mexico has also have an abstention, but Brazil has a complete support for Russia due to its alliance to the BRICS. Okay. So at least in Latin America, there's there are different positions that you have a complete support for Ukraine in Argentina, complete support from Russia in Brazil and neutrality in Mexico and Chile, for example, that it's the, uh, the next economy in line. We can say that it has a more pro-Ukraine stance. I mean... I also completely agree with Nick that the Russia, the Russian influence, had a lot of influence in Africa, especially because of the, the the food, the food, the providing of wheat and food for these uh, countries, which uh, at the end of the day have a lot of impact in uh, political stability. Because in Latin America, when transport gets really expensive, uh, that affects political stability. When in Africa, food gets really expensive. That completely destroys political stability and you have riots and violence on the streets. So I think Russia played really uh, strategically that card and it was really useful. But what I'm really interested about is also the character of our previous analysis, that is Brazil, that it's the problem of uh, where are you kept standing? That we were talking with you, Caitlin, before the, the podcast started about the how are how are all the positions going to change? Not only at least in the global south, but especially yeah. in Latin America regarding the U.S. election. We're talking about uh, Donald Trump, for example, being more supportive of uh, of Russia of Russia or having a more friendly position with Russia. But in the end of the day, it would mean that when, every time he says he's going to solve the conflict in five minutes, we all know that he mean, he means he's going to call Putin and say. Hey, this is this is what are we offering for you for the conflict for the conflict to stop, and that would mean Ukraine losing a lot of a lot of parts of its territory to um, make Putin uh, stop. And all the, at the end of the day, the idea was to move forward with the strategy that also used uh, Kissinger of separating Russia from China, and that would be a key movement for Russia because. Russia, be, after the U.S. sanction and the Western sanction, has become increasingly dependent on China for having its mm -hmm. economy moving. And if the U.S. has a more pro, uh, if the West and the U.S. has a more pro-Russia stance in this conflict and the conflict end, and Russia can start having commerce against with the West, it would be a strategic move for from Putin's perspective because he would lose dependency from China, but at the same time, he would gain territory. So it would be a, I mean, a masterclass move because he would have only wins in his, on his side. And the West would have, be, would be, would, would be seen weak for, for weakening its own stance defending Ukraine. So 
in my opinion, in my opinion, what happens to countries like Brazil is that going to be coming in a really uncomfortable position if Donald Trump is uh, at the end of the day elected president, because they are aligned with China economically on the BRICS, and they supported Russia from the beginning. So I'm really, I'm really interested in, in what's going to happen with countries like Brazil, for example, that are that are completely aligned with that with that excess of power that is uh, Russia and China. And at the end of the day, they will have to choose. And they, what happens in Latin America, especially, is that Russia has a lot of uh, maybe rhetoric influence or or political influence, but not a lot of economic influence. The key player in the region is China, and if China and if China and Russia are separated uh, because of this issue, or, or at least economically and politically separated because China, uh, Russia leads, move, leads forward to the West, this would mean uh, a very uncomfortable position for these countries. And Russia, I mean, Brazil probably will, will choose China because it has a lot of economic influence and investments on Brazil. Mm -hmm. But uh, countries like Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, which are countries we have historical uh, relations with Russia, would be on a, on a in a complex scenario because aligning with Russia would mean a political alignment, but not an economic alignment. And countries like Venezuela, which uh, are sold mainly all their arms, the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro buys all its arms from from Russia, would be a, a lot in another big problem. So. I'm not all, I'm not very interested in I'm very interested in the small characters that depend a lot of, of of Russia and China and are are going to be in a problem if Russia leans more forward to the West. Yeah, Nick, I feel uh you want to to add something, but to be fair, uh I should express my uh, my opinion in our uh of the record discussion with uh, with Tobias. I said that at the end, um, even if Donald Trump or Kamara Harris uh, will uh, will win, um, the the American establishment uh, preferred to have uh, to have the Russian Federation closer than uh, than the China the, the the Chinese government. Nick, please your your comment. No, I agree with that, and unfortunately, I do find that um, to be almost true. And somewhat still in the European Union, where some number states are really seeing their economy suffers, especially Germany losing that cheap economic energy. And just mm -hmm. honestly, probably the worst thing that the West could have done almost, it seemed, was somewhat dictating the way that Ukraine fought its war, where it was all for giving weapons and somewhat supporting them. But as long as um, it was mainly Ukraine playing defense, while now we're seeing where Ukraine finally in August started uh, invading the Kursk uh, Oblast of Russia, where that's what it almost needed to do in 2022 when the war first started and being more aggressive too, rather than trying to play this weak defensive position that didn't help it and get anywhere in two years. And now finally going into the third year, now that they finally were being more aggressive and now with uh, Western allies uh, not being against it, uh, realizing, well, okay, maybe that will help the war get somewhere. And just, it almost seems that, especially in the West, some of these nations just have become a little too hesitant in trying to dictate other countries how they have to fight these conflicts because so many generations in Western Europe or the US have never seen the mainland invaded uh, in a major war like Ukraine has, not realizing that with a country like Russia, it's really, you're not really going to get anywhere uh, through diplomacy. You're not going to get uh, much uh, progress accomplished through someone trying to play defense. Now that they uh, started being more aggressive, you saw even an attack on Moscow and then with Russia's own military uh, really messing up how it shut down uh, the drones and how it injured civilians itself, uh, 100% the fault of Russia and how they shot down those drones. It seems like it might actually get somewhere. And now the fact that Ukraine actually has occupied Russian territory, it will make it much more easier uh, 
to have a swap, but and yeah. you know, and I don't know. You know, it's hard to say because I know a lot of people try to say that, oh, well, if Trump gets in, it's all over. It's like, okay, but we're not really hearing too much. It's not really convincing what Kamala, especially in a lot of these Western allies where, yes, they're allies giving weapons and stuff, but how they expected Ukraine to be so constricted for so long, which didn't really benefit the country in the long run. It's yeah. like, okay, but are we truly helping them or are we just dragging this war out and not helping them get anywhere and how much destruction's occurred in Ukraine? But now it's finally getting somewhere because it's also been playing a bit of offense where unfortunately Ukraine hasn't been able to reconquer its territory conquered by Russia. But at the same time, that's the bartering chip it needs is also having Russian land under its control to say, okay. Uh, you know, and if it does conquer a large enough amount, it could actually then possibly go to the table and say, OK, let's call it a deal. 1991 land borders, uh, give it or t uh, leave it or take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, just to interrupt a moment. I was yeah, thinking sure. Nico, while you were speaking uh, I, last summer, I read a biography of Philip Short about Vladimir Putin. Great biography about Vladimir Putin. Um. He was. He talked a lot about uh, how Putin, during his his own presidency and he, all his presidencies, he started to notice that the West, at the end of the days, abandons his non-NATO allies. Yes, he he separated himself with the Chechen with the Chechen conflict. He separated. Uh, I mean, then he was suffered in Syria. He saw it on Syria. He then saw it. On Afghanistan, and now we're pro and now what the author concluded was he's probably thinking that at the end of the day he gets a long war and that that affects the economy of the West. The West is probably going to abandon Ukraine at the end of the day because they won't be able to because he's dictate. I mean, he he being an autocrat, he he has the possibility of forcing people to resist despite a. Despite their 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 op their opposition to the war, that doesn't happen in the West. So he plays that in his favor to just basically to to make the conflict longer, and that the West uh, finally at the end of the day do what it always did with the non-NATO allies that that is abandoning them. Yeah, unfortunately, I should agree with you, uh, but as we have explored today. Uh, the clash between uh, between the big tech company and uh, um, democracy highlights a critical issue at the at the uh, intersection of free speech, uh, national sovereignty, and uh, the fight against disinformation. And this debate uh, is not just about um, uh, personal uh, rivalries and uh, personal thoughts. It raises um, uh, larger questions about the role of tech um, companies in shaping public discourse and the balance, uh, the balance governments must strike to protect the demo uh, democratic institution without uh, over overreaching. Similarly, um, the Russian Federation's growing engagement in the global south uh, reflects uh, um, uh, a total uh, a total shifting geopolitical landscape where uh, where emerging uh, alliances uh, are playing an uh, an increasingly influential role in uh, in, in global conflict like the war in Ukraine. Um, this involving dynamics will continue to, I think, will continue to shape international relations in the years to come. I really want to thank our our guest Tobias Belgrano for uh, for his uh, his perspectives and his uh, his thoughts. And as always, a big uh, thank you to to my co-host Nick Zalewski. If you enjoyed today's discussion, uh, make sure to, sub to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media to stay updated with our latest uh, content. We'd love 
for uh, for you to be part of our growing community uh, here at the EU Spectator Podcast. Where and without... even if you hated it, go ahead and comment it. Say that you it's trash. Uh, go ahead and comment with whatever emoji you want. Uh, something blue if you think Kamala Harris is going to win, and orange if it's going to be Donald Trump. Respond in any way you want, positive or negative. We don't mind. And of course, uh, we are waiting for for your comments uh, for uh, for this episode, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, stay tuned for more in depth analysis and uh, and discussion with uh, with us. Thank you very much once again, both of you.